fine. Okay. So, um, Professor Nigel Mason started his career at the University College London UCL. And uh, we have seen him uh, as a, an excellent researcher, a teacher, and a collaborator. He would encourage others to collaborate at the international level for experiments, for theory also. And then, um, very happy to say that uh, he is a frequent visitor to India. My, my students have benefited with his collaboration. And then from University College London, he went to um, that um, Milton Keynes, the Open University at Milton Keynes, and now he is at the University of Kent in UK. So the best way, as I said, the best introduction of the speaker is the lecture itself. So I think that is it, because all of us know him very well. I'm sure everybody knows him. Everybody has enjoyed um, his, uh, his stay here, and people have gone there, worked with him. So wonderful. wonderful. And, and finally, oh, how can I forget? How can I forget uh, um, my book jointly with him? My book, Atomic Molecular Ionization, Theory and application. The book was published uh, 2019 January by Cambridge University Press. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> okay. So I hope everybody can hear me. Thank you very much for that, uh, that very kind introduction. Uh, yes, it is a <laughs> Namaste, we say. Namaste. So it's very kind uh, to be, be asked to give this uh, uh, webinar, this talk uh, on astrobiology. Uh, I'm going to do something slightly different than perhaps the other talks in the astrobiology series because I'm going to concentrate on the use of a technique to to explore various assets of astrobiology. Just uh, microphone, yes. Okay, so I hope you can all hear. Yeah. So, what is astrobiology? I think I mean you've had a few talks in this series, but I just want to 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 um, to to review it. Now, astrobiology. Um, has been around for some time, but not always under that name. We're very lucky that we're probably living in the age where astrobiology as a scientific theme is going to actually be a mainstream science. So people entering the field now, starting PhDs, starting even maybe undergraduate degrees, will be able to start to think about a subject called astrobiology. Um, it's it, in, in essence, to, to astrobiology is, I think, of astrobiology to answer yes. questions uh, in modern times. Yes. Uh, we've looked okay, at the 20th century, century uh, yeah. birth of quantum so mechanics. So what is astrobiology, I think? I mean, you've had a few talks in this series, but I just want to, 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 um, of scientists to, to review world. it. Now, astrobiology would also inspire the public. And the question is, very lucky that we're probably living in the age where astrobiology... Where and how did life begin on Earth? And is there life elsewhere in the universe? Now, these are two very basic questions with very complex scientific challenges. But I think we actually are lucky enough to live probably uh, in the era where those answers to those questions will actually occur. If you're starting out as an undergraduate or a postgraduate now, it is not unreasonable to think that in your lifetime, we will actually have answers to these questions. And how exciting will that be? This is a slide that some of you may have seen before. This is the kind of a uh, very interesting slide that was put together about uh, 20 years ago now, uh, when the field was being developed on the origins of life on Earth. Um, I just want to show it because it was put together by some of the leading people in the field, including some of the Nobel Prize winners. Uh, but it just shows, I think, very well that, that that simple question of the origins of life on Earth has an enormous range of different types of question and science and techniques that you need to know to answer that question. So it's a huge field um, and you can divide the field into many subfields, but perhaps one of the things that we should concentrate on are the techniques that we use to answer some of those questions. So very nice slides to say to show all the different things. Um, to answer the questions, we need to ask the scientific questions. And two of the main scientific questions are, are the conditions sustaining life common throughout the universe? And how is material needed for life, what we call the prebiotic material formed? And this is where we overlap with a more a field which is slightly older and a topic that's slightly older, which of course you've all heard of, which is called astrochemistry. But whether we're doing astrophysics, whether we're doing astrochemistry, or whether they're both being rolled into the broader topic of astrobiology, the question is, how do we do it? So if we want to explore space, we have two options. Uh, we can go there with spacecraft, or we can observe remotely. 
But in both cases, the tools in which we used to actually understand and study what is out there, particularly what the chemical species are out there, or whether even indeed we might be looking for plant life, they are spectroscopic tools. And so what I want to do in this talk is explain how spectroscopy in its broadest form is used as a tool in astrobiology research. I'm going to give some applications of spectroscopy in astrobiology. And one of the ones, for example, is how we might identify biosignatures. So what signatures would we look for on another planet, which we could physically go to, or to a uh, look at another planet uh, remotely, an exoplanet? What sort of chemical signatures would we look for? And that has to be done by spectroscopy. Now, everybody knows about spectroscopy, but I, I just summarize what everybody likes to always say, is that every atom or molecule has a spectral fingerprint. So the fortunate thing about spectroscopy is that if you measure spectra, you can from the spectra identify what compounds you're seeing. And that's really the kind of rubric of running it. But the spectroscopy and spectra, spectra it, it's a very wide region, and, and we work across a whole range of regions, and all of these are of astrobiology interest. From at the bottom of this one, the lowest energy energy, the radio waves, radios and uh, radio wave and microwave spectroscopy is essentially what we use in, in a lot of astronomy to look for molecules that might exist in the interstellar medium. They might look in planetary uh, formating systems. And then we go through the more traditional uh, infrared spectroscopy, which is a very well-known technique which we use in analytical chemistry on Earth. But, of course, we can also use uh, to look at, for example, as you see at the end of the talk, we're looking at uh, biosignatures in rocks. We have the visible and the near ultraviolet and the vacuum ultraviolet, which we increasingly use, for example, in planetary exploration. And, of course, you could go up to uh, X-rays and gamma rays, which is much more about the kind of energy systems that you're using. And so different scientists and different communities tend to work in different spectral regions. And although these things are very, very general, um, I think that's an important thing to note, that when we bring these people together to study astrobiology, or we bring them together in an astrobiology conference, you will see many different types of spectroscopy being used and being spoken about. So broadly, and these are very broad categories, astronomers like to work in the radio and the microwave region. That's what they particularly use in the astrochemistry region. Um, also, they like to look in the X-ray region. They're easy to see looking at uh, X-ray systems, uh, looking at uh, star formation systems is quite good. Chemists and geologists on Earth particularly might be looking for the origins of life. They might be working predominantly in the infrared region. And planetary science is increasingly using ultraviolet spectroscopy, um, an area which is very topical um, with some of the more recent Horizons missions and the spectrometers on that. It's also uh, very topical because it's some of the work that, that I and good colleagues like Barlow and so on are doing in India. I just wanted to mention, because it's the new toy, and again, it's relevant because if you're in India, uh, you will probably have heard about the new terahertz radiation system being developed at PRL by Barlow. But terahertz radiation is, is, is the, new, the new toy on the block. For those of you who don't know where terahertz is, it's, it's here. Um, it's about um, the terahertz region. Its frequency is about 10 to the 12 hertz. Wavelength, if you like, 300 microns, 300 centimeters to the minus one. Uh, this is a kind of new new system, and we've now got two types of, of, of uh, work with terahertz. We have the basic spectroscopy of terahertz, which is exactly the same as we use in ultraviolet spectroscopy and infrared spectroscopy. We basically measure absorption and transmission spectra of maybe, for example, an ice. But you will also know terahertz from its use as an imaging technique. Uh, it can be, it's being used increasingly in a whole wide variety of things. It's used as also in security. So here are some examples of uh, a visible image of the human tooth on the left here. On the right, you're seeing a terahertz spectroscopy, a terahertz image of the human tooth. The difference is on the terahertz image, you can quite clearly see that they can distinguish between the enamel, uh, the, uh, enamel on the top of your tooth and material inside the tooth. So they can look for decay, they can look at the strength of the material and so on and how much is being made. And we also use it in security screening. You, you've you heard about security spanners and so on. You can detect uh, drugs, for example, um, by terahertz. And the advantage is that terahertz uh, is, is inherently safer than x-rays. You, you all know that you can only be exposed to a certain number of x-rays per year 
x-rays can lead to, to damaging effects. Whereas at the moment, as far as we know, uh, the conclusions are that terahertz spectroscopy and using terahertz radiation produces no uh, damage to you uh, or to the samples themselves as well. Another problem with x-rays is, of course, they can actually damage the sample. So terahertz spectroscopy is new, and although it's been around now uh, maybe for maybe five or six years since the original experiments were done, it's, it's only increasing quite slowly. Uh, and that's mainly because of the problems in the in the techniques that you need. You need quite complicated laser systems to get that to work, and they're not easy to operate. And there aren't many, and they're expensive. So you're very lucky in India in having one. Um, in the UK, we haven't got our one yet. We have asked for the money for it. We haven't got it. So um, we, most of the terahertz spectroscopy in the UK is being used for security, not, not for space ast astronomy. But we hope we will soon. The advantage of using terahertz is that you 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 can find new bands in terahertz. Uh, the problem with infrared spectroscopy, as you'll see in a moment, is it doesn't really completely identify the molecule you see. It identifies the, the chemical species, the, the, the chemical groups, but not always the molecules, whereas terahertz gives you some more uh, identifiable fingerprints. So it's being applied, uh, particularly with my colleague uh, here in the UK, uh, Sergio Opolo, um, who did the first sort of ice chemistry system using terahertz in Caltech. Um, he then came back to the UK and has been developing a system here. But the new telescopes will allow observations in the terahertz. So ALMA is already operating there, and JWST, which will eventually come online in the next few years, will be operating in the terahertz spectroscopy system. So I can't show you too many results. Um, this because there hasn't been so many done, uh, we are getting the first spectrum of these things. So, so these are some results taken a few years ago on glycolaldehyde, um, which is, of course, the first sugar we're looking for in space. It has a characteristic terahertz line, which we can go and look for and perhaps go and detect in the interstellar medium as well. Okay, to just again, before I go into to examples and details, just go back to the infrared. Um, as I say, most spectra that have been used in astrobiology or astrochemistry uh, experiments have tended to work in the infrared region. They've tended to use uh, infrared spectroscopy and spectrometers in the lab. Uh, they've tended to use a lot of them from space telescopes. Although we, we talk about the spectroscopy being able to identify molecules, that's, that's not quite true. What they actually do is identify specific chemical groups. Because that they tell you that the molecule you're looking at has got an OHCH or an NH group, um, so you can only really get the molecular fingerprint if you if you measure that remotely by your telescope. But then you have the lab data to actually match up all those different lines together before you can put it together. So it, it, it provides you something about the structure, uh, may tell you about the formula, but it's not entirely specific to the individual molecule. Molecules. Therefore, you sometimes have to use other techniques in collaboration with it, for example, ultraviolet. Again, the reasons we're predominantly interested in because of the astrochemistry, astrobiology, because of the biological interest, we're mainly interested in carbon uh, bonds. So you can see here just the typical infrared absorption range 600 to 4,000 centimeters minus one is your sort of typical regions that you'd be working in if you want to look in, the, in, the, in these regions. So these are your sort of typical astrobiology regions if you're working in the infrared. And you get a typical spectrum, something like this. This is ethanol, uh, very easy to measure both in the gas phase and the liquid phase, although we don't really in astrobiology tend to work too much in the liquid phase. Uh, but it's certainly in the ice phase when you're in, in the interstellar space. And you can see a typical spectrum that you could record. Um, they tell you all the different bonds that are in there. And from this picture, you can put it together and you can say you've discovered ethanol. So it's a bit of detective work. Um, you can do these experiments really relatively easily. You then compare those by going into the into space, and this is a, a classic example of of, of the um, of, of looking for the formation of molecules in the interstellar medium. These are the prebiotic compounds. You want to see what's out there, uh, particularly in ones that might be used in those regions that are actually kind of forming the planets. They might be part of the planet formation process. Uh, here is your sort of typical uh, spectra. You've got the top one there of water ice, at the bottom there one of methanol ice uh, with some carbon dioxide ice uh, there too. So we can see these bands in space. We do know that these molecules are there and we know that they are in the ice phase. Um, if I do it again, 
a little bit more detail, if I look at what we call the pillars of creation, uh, which many of you will probably have heard about in the interstellar ice, this is the spectrum <coughs> from this uh, dark cloud, W33A. Um, the first one really to show a lot of ice spectra. And you can see here identified several uh, transitions, several bands, absorption bands are in there, which have been marked. Um, there is some solid state um, curves. So we, we, we are looking here at some silicate grains. So we're not only looking at the ices, we're also looking at the grains that make them up. So we've got some geology here as well. Very important also, as you'll see when we come back to looking at Earth, uh, molecules and rocks on Earth. So we've got the silicates here and then we've got the molecules on top. We have water, we have methane, we have ammonia, we have CO, CO2, ethanol, some more complicated molecules, sulfur is an important compound, uh, as you can see. So what we can then do is to say, hey, we've got that spectrum in space, let's now go into the lab, let's make up a mixture of those ices and see if they compare so that we can identify the, the temperature, for example, of that ice in space, maybe the type of the ice, is it a crystalline ice, is it an amorphous ice? This is a very simple experiment done at the Open University uh, last year uh, with my student, uh, uh, Rachel. And you can just see here, um, a simple mixture is going to take CO2 and ammonia to ice together. Very easy spectra to look at. This is the infrared spectra. We, we can see the different combination bands of CO2. We can see the different combinations of NH3. And then we can uh, irradiate that ice. We can, we can, we can give it some energy. Uh, it doesn't matter where we, how we put the energy in. It could be ultraviolet light. It could be photon bombardment, it could be electron bombardment, it could be as Barlow and PRL does and so on, it could be shocks. And after we've irradiated it, we find some other molecules that have been made. Sorry, go back. So you still got those molecules there, which are the original ones. But if I zoom into some of these peaks, I've made some new ones. I've made some CO from breaking up the CO2. And I've made this uh, OCN minus by combining the combination of the breakdown of CO2 together with the breakdown of ammonia, they react together within the ice and they make OCN. And that, of course, is exactly what I see in that peak there. So by combining spectroscopic uh, identification in the laboratory, I can go back to my W33 and I can look at those ices and I can say, OK, I think I know how that band has been formed. It's made by a combination of dissociation of ammonia, which I've already seen in the ice and CO2 to make these bands. And here is a, if we look at that band in detail, you can see that the laboratory picture at the bottom and what was identified as some type of CN at the top, but well, you can see they look pretty close. So that's a pretty good idea. You will also see that the OCN is negatively charged. It's an anion that's also important in, in astrochemistry and the type of formation that we're making. It also tells us maybe how it's made, maybe via electron attachment or some type of combination like that. So it's very easy to show that by doing this, this, this linking together spectroscopy and observations, we can actually start to talk about the methods. There are now more than 140 molecules. I think it's probably about 150 molecules now. Uh, I won't go through them all, but I just want to show you some of the richness of them. We, we've got some interesting uh, interest molecules that can lead on to astrobiology. Formic acid is a classic, acetic acid there. Glycolaldehyde, that first sugar I showed you a few minutes ago. Uh, glycine, we, we, glycine is still being debated. We're absolutely, we're pretty sure it's there. Um, the, the, the evidence is we have a not conclusive in some of the observational spectra, but certainly with uh, JWST, it will be one of the first compounds that we will identify. It's almost certainly there, and we'll almost certainly identify it. Um, there's lots of other rich compounds. There's benzene compounds. There are also some compounds in space we don't find on Earth, like long chain molecules made up of uh, carbon and nitrogen poly, poly, uh, cyanopolyenes. Where else are we doing spectroscopy? Well, classically, not just on uh, looking into dust clouds, but what about actually uh, space objects? The classic, uh, most recently in the last few years, has been Rosetta going to a comet, looking at the composition of a comet. Some of you, I'm sure, have seen this picture. Uh, from the, the, the team um, who built one of the, the Rosina detector, uh, mass spectrometry type detector. I won't talk about mass spectrometry as spectroscopy. It's another type of spectroscopy, of course. I'm only going to talk about optical spectroscopy in, in, in the talk here. I haven't got time to talk about the other one. But again, just to give you an idea of the richness of the chemistry that is out there. 
Uh, now, this is a, this is an interesting slide because um, there's another detector uh, also on Rosetta, which also is looking at molecules. And the two teams don't necessarily agree wholeheartedly on whether each of the molecules has been seen. Um, the, so, but nonetheless, I just wanted to show you this one because it gives you an idea of the richness of the molecules that we will go and look for. All of these molecules will have spectral signatures. So, so infrared or your UV or terahertz spectroscopy may enable us to look at comets in the future from a remote technique. Now, our own per my own personal interest and, and, and working with people in India, particularly Bala and the people at PRL, in the last uh, decade or so has been not only to look at astrochemical ices in the interstellar medium, but increasingly to look at planetary ices and objects that we can actually go and visit with spacecraft. These are just some of the uh, planetary ices. Um, most of the uh, planets, uh, apart from ourselves and Mars, of course, are, are, are not rocky solids. So most of the systems we're looking for for ice actually are the planetary moons rather than the planetary ices. But there's a huge range of these moons out there. And these are actually the, the, the systems that we predominantly want to look at in the next few years. Um, this is the absorption spectra taken on some of the moons. This is an old spectrum taken on, on, on some of the Saturn's moons. Uh, you can see there Rhea, Deone. We'll talk about those again. There's an absorption band you can see there on the left at around about 250 nanometers. Um, this is actually very interesting because, as we will see, this is actually due to the molecule of ozone. This is a, a recent spectra taken from the Cassini mission uh, of Rhea. Uh, it's a very rich spectrum. It's got lots of uh, structures and so on in it. It's one that uh, we've been analyzing um, with a PhD student uh, and Amanda Hendricks in the US, um, who actually was the instant person on the Alice spectrometer. The box highlights some, some structures in the 170, 180 nanometer region. Um, now, this is a very interesting region because there are structures in there for in the UV, which you don't see in the infrared. The infrared has too many overlapping bands, but in the UV, we've managed to see some structures. And at the moment, we're tentatively putting some of these structures into a very interesting molecule called hydrazine. Um, but it just shows that if you've got laboratory data and you can combine it with these observational data, you'll see it's quite noisy, by the way. The, the, the red uh, line here is actually the, the, the data taken from the Alice spectrometer. The blue is a fit to that data, it's a smooth fit to that data. Um, and of course, this just shows you again that if you're going to spend a space, send a spacecraft out there, it's not going to give you as nice a spectra with nice resolution and, and signal to noise as you're going to get in the laboratory. So there's always quite a lot of investigative work in doing it. In Europe, we're getting very excited because our next big space mission after the Cassini Huygens one, the, the, UK, the European mission, the European mission to space, <coughs> built by in Europe, is going to go to the moon of Jupiter. It's called JUICE. That's the icy moons of Jupiter. This is some old data from Galileo uh, looking at Io, uh, the volcanic moon of Jupiter. And it shows here a very strong band at around about 240. This is your sulfur dioxide, which comes out of the volcanoes from Io and then settles as a snow or as a frost absorption feature. So we're going to need a lot more uh, data collected in the next few years of, of infrared and UV data um, of the molecules that we're hoping to see on the icy moons of Jupiter. We will need to do those experiments in the right temperature, pressure and so on conditions. And most recently, there's also data from Pluto and so on as well. So this just aims to highlight a particular area of spectroscopy that perhaps isn't as well known as the infrared. It's, it doesn't have many people working in it. And that is the ultraviolet spectroscopy. Ultraviolet spectroscopy is a incredibly powerful tool for trying to identify molecules uh, because of their spectral fingerprints in the UV. Um, but most of the experiments have been relatively limited and many of the experiments are rather old. Um, the classic... Um, Almonds, uh, were done in the 1980s and there's a classic textbook called Robin which published a summary of that um, in the late 1980s early 1990s and it's, we kind of use it as our atlas it's incredibly out of date and somebody at some time really should sit down and rewrite it because we put it in all the new data the problem is that's all kind of gas phase UV spectroscopy taken in laboratories up to a wavelength of about 200 nanometers 
If you want to go beyond 200 nanometers, lower than 200 nanometers, you can't do that in the laboratory because that's where the air starts to absorb your ultraviolet light. So you need to have a light source and a system that can operate in the uh, in the, in the UV from say 200 down to about 115 nanometers, which for space conditions is classic because that's the Lyman alpha edge. And for that, we have to use synchrotrons. So this is the sort of experiments that we have. I think Barla is actually sitting in a laboratory running this. And if you look actually behind Barla when he's giving his, when he's talking to you, you will see an apparatus that looks remarkably like this. Um, it's very similar to one. It's the one that he he has in India, which is very similar to this one, which we have in our laboratory. Um, we have to make a high vacuum uh, system, as I said, to, to, to operate. We have to have a cryostat so that we can go down to temperatures. We'd like to get down to, to 10 Kelvin for interstellar medium. Planetary ices are a little bit warmer than that. And we basically put some gas onto a substrate, we form an ice, and then we irradiate the ice uh, either with an infrared spectrometer or from the synchrotron UV spectrometer, and we measure the spectra. The synchrotron we've tended to use most in Europe is the Astrid synchrotron in Denmark. Um, it, it, Astrid 1 has operated for about 20, 30 years, and in the last two or three years now, they have another one, Astrid 2, which is an upgrade of that. And this is where we can do most of our ice spectrometry. So this is where most of the data have been taken. Again, I'll, I'll, uh, this is just to show the type of systems that we have for those of you who are experimentalists. It's quite a simple system. As I say, you have the high vacuum conditions. You have your cryostat um, continuous flow, um, closed cycle now. The substrates we have to use the ice on top of have to be either UV or infrared um, transmission. So for UV studies, that's calcium or magnesium fluoride. For infrared, it tends to be typically zinc selenide. We deposit the samples and we look at the chemistry. Now, that's a whole new talk. That's a whole other talk, and I'm not going to give you all the spectral data that we have of that. Just to give you the, the view on UV spectroscopy, where we are today. What it provides you with is vital information, not only on the type of molecules you've got there, but the phase in which they are. And the classic is that you tend to have two types of ice. You have a crystalline ice and you have an amorphous ice. The subsequent chemistry and the subsequent formation of prebiotic molecules does depend upon that morphology. The change from an amorphous ice to a crystalline ice tells you something about the way in which that ice has been processed. Maybe it's been heated and recooled. Maybe it's been bombarded, etc. And normally, when you go from amorphous to crystalline, that's where it stops. At least that's what all the textbooks will tell you. Except again, unfortunately, or fortunately, more recently, experiments we've done again in collaboration with people in India and our collaborators in Taiwan have shown that's not, for some molecules, that's not entirely true. We do do a comparison of gas and condensed phase. Uh, they do show significant differences in the shift in the electronic states. This is, this is obvious if you know some basic physics and chemistry, uh, but it's very important because um, a lot of models use gas phase data because that's what they've got. That means that they can misinterpret the observation. It's no good just saying what is there. You often need to know how much of it is there. Um, therefore, you need to measure cross sections. And again, that's quite difficult sometimes to calculate or even determine what a cross section is in the gas in the solid phase. Much easier in the solid phase. So the the rules of the game are that 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 don't use gas phase in your models. Uh, you actually have to do the hard work and you have to do the UV. And um, the Indian connection here, as I say, is very much Bala, who's hosting this today. Um, he has, a, as you all know, the astrochemistry laboratory to study spectra, to study absorption. He's doing the chemical transitions and shocks and irradiation. But he's also led the, the, the UK, India, other collaboration to use uh, synchrotrons in, in Taiwan to measure these spectra. It's no good if you don't just collect this. You've got to put it into a database. The database we actually use is this one. Um, we have a series of databases being collected so that the community can use them, um, where we can comp compare the solid state with the gas phase. We measure absolute cross sections. We can compare the infrared spectra. There are two which you should look at if you're interested in this. Something is called SHADE, S-H-A-D-E. It's part of the EuroPlanet research infrastructure. If you haven't heard about Europlanet uh, and you're interested in planetary science or even astrochemistry, you should go and look on it. It's also a data portal called FAMDC. And again, um, NDM community has been involved in the development of the FAMDC portal. Uh, 
Bala uh, has developed actually a portal um, for putting together all this astrochemical ISIS data. It's called ACID, the Astrochemical ISIS database. It's hosted, as you can see there, at PRL. Um, very powerful uh, system. Uh, got an awful large number of molecules. You can see there it not only has UV, uh, it also has infrared data. Okay, so I'm going to just now show you some examples of where we're using spectroscopy in applications of astrobiology for the rest of the talk, and then cut draw together some conclusions at the end. So let's start with infrared studies um, and how they're used in exoplanet studies. So I think you've all heard talks, I'm sure you've all heard talks on exoplanets and the exciting uh, discovery in the last couple of decades, recently, last year won the Nobel Prize as well, um, for actually detecting planets around other stars. Now, this is very interesting because when I was doing my PhD, which, which was a fair time ago, but, but you know, in history terms, not that long ago, in the early in the 1980s and beginning of the 1990s, um, people still debated whether they you know, whether planets would have many stars, would have many planets around them. Um, then came this classic way of measuring um, a planet moving past the star and looking for the eclipse, looking for the... Uh, the, the drop in the light curve from the star. In, today, it seems just increasingly obvious. I mean, how on earth could we not have thought about that? Uh, well, uh, nothing is as obvious until it's done. And also the technology and the techniques to be able to stabilize the detection of, of light curves from, from planetary objects requires computing and requires adjustments and filtering and everything else. The interesting thing now is that uh, we've gone beyond that because what happens now is we want to say, OK, we found the planet, but has it got an atmosphere? And if it's got an atmosphere, can we can we look at that atmosphere? And the answer to that is yes, because as the planet goes around the star, particularly as it just starts to disappear behind it again, if it's lined at the right angle, the light from the star just goes through that thin layer of the upper atmosphere. And then you can then measure the spectra of that light coming through that atmosphere. You measure the spectrum of the star, you measure the spectrum of the of the planet plus the star, and then you take them away, you will get the, the atmosphere. Um, it's tough, though. It, it, it's not easy to do. The present spectra, as you'll see in a minute, are not well-defined. The resolution is pretty poor. You have to then try, you know, try and work out what molecules you've got in the atmosphere. And that you have to do by sort of putting together a theoretical synthesis by building up uh, spectra that you've collected in the laboratory predominantly, remembering that these are now going to be gas phase spectra, and you've got to do them at the right temperature. And sometimes these planets may be hot Jupiters, so you may need to have the spectra of your molecules at very high temperatures, which often we don't have. So to basically think that you're going to get this all by spec by measurement is too much. So most of the data is going to come by calculating. Uh, and calculating line shapes and spectra, and then benchmarking them against the experiment. And these are some of the biggest computational experiments that have been done. The, the num measuring the spectra of, of water, for example, might seem obvious, but if you actually have to calculate from, from first principles, quantum mechanics and the FT type calculations, the spectra of water, um, it's huge data. And therefore, there's a high degree of interpretation or trust. Uh, you need better spectra. Uh, statistics and new beta based benchmarking. This, 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 is the, this is a classic one. Uh, this is one of the first ones that was ever done by uh, Georgina Tinetti. And I show this one because I think it shows the point of, of the difficulty in actually getting the data. Now, uh, Giovanni now is actually in charge of Ariel. Ariel is going to be the next. Uh, well, we have several uh, missions to look at exoplanets in Europe. We have uh, Plato, we have Cheops. Uh, Cheops, and but Aria will be the piece de resistance. This will be the one that's actually gained at having a space-based platform to look at atmospheres of other planets. Now, what you've got here um, is, is is the way that, that all this data has been done. But I think this original paper in 2007, if you want to read about planetary atmospheres, go back to the original paper, because the original paper lays out all the problems. Subsequent papers assume that you know all the problems, and therefore, they just send you. They just show you spectra. But you want to go back to the original one. Go back to the early 2007 papers when they were the first ones to try and do this. 
So um, here you have um, some spectra that have been synthesized by taking data from the database and putting them together. And they've tried to, to mix up some data um, from different infrared spectra and uh, for different molecules. And then they compare them with the experiments. And the experiments, as you can see here, the observations here are just single points. As you get a bit better, um, this is a more recent one, then you can start to see you get a few more data points, but they're still points, they're not spectra. What you've got here is some models. You'll see the blue graph is where I've added some methane to it. The previous ones, um, you've got, um, so the, first, the top one is, is, is the bin one, the blue one is, I think, water and methane. Then I've added some ammonia, then we've added some carbon monoxide. And as you add extra molecules, you can see you get closer and closer to, to, to the experiment. And this is how we're actually trying to say whether those exoplanets, what their atmospheres are made up of. This is how, when you read in the paper, oh, yes, it's a water world and we've discovered that it's rich in, in, in hydrocarbons. This is the data that you're actually looking at. Um, and you can just do this uh, more and more, but it's, it's a complicated process. So we can detect chemical compositions of exoplanets. Um, these are some of the molecules that have been detected. Uh, people are now even trying to look for currents in these atmospheres. They're trying to see how they change, maybe as the, as the, as, as the uh, planet rotates, uh, to look, for example, for weather and for seasons. But they're all based on the basis of the fact that we have a good spectral database, we understand that spectral database, and we can calculate those, those synthetic spectrum. It's not easy. But the real question is, could we ever hope to detect life on a new Earth? So we now have these planets that People will see it's becoming a little bit blasé now. I mean, you get a lot of these uh, press releases say, oh, we found another exoplanet that is Earth-like. Okay, that's fine. So it, what does we mean by that? It means that we found a planet that's about the right temperature as Earth, which means it's got liquid water on it, or it's temperatures where it can have oceans. But that doesn't tell us that there's life on it. So how could we see life on Earth from space is one of the ways. If we, can't, if we go out into space and look back at Earth, where we know we are, there's life, what sort of things do you look for uh, spectroscopically when you're looking back at the Earth? And the answer to that is you take, you take some spectra like this. Um, so everybody believes that you need CO2, methane and water. But the problem is those molecules are made both biologically and non-biologically, abiotically. Um, so people did believe that for a long time that the best biomarker was ozone. Um, ozone was meant to be that if you found ozone on a planetary atmosphere, this would tell you at an oxygen-rich atmosphere, an oxygen-rich atmosphere had to be because you had some process like photosynthesis. We know an awful lot about ozone. Uh, we know the spectroscopy of ozone, probably the best of almost any molecule other than perhaps water, because of the ozone hole depletion. And you'll all know the problem with the ozone hole depletion, and you also know its importance that if we didn't have ozone, it absorbs in this region around about 254 nanometers, so it filters out all that harmful UV light, which comes from stars, down onto the surface. If you didn't have an ozone layer, it'd be very hard to live on the surface, because otherwise you'd end up like this. Uh, you'd end up with sunburn, and you'd actually get gene uh, genetic damage. Now, that means that life may not emerge. So people have been looking for ozone on other planets. Yes, we found it on Earth. It was on Mars. It was first found on the Mars Express mission. We know it there with the new. Uh, Mars emissions will be monitoring it, but it's very small. And indeed, we don't think of any of the models that we've ever got, that it'd be very hard to think there was ever an ozone layer on Mars, which would be strong enough to sort of support life as we know it. So that's a problem. That's why people want to look underneath the soil of Mars, because life may have evolved there, and then the soil is shielding the, that life from UV. We found ozone on other planets, Ganymede and Dione and Rhea. So the Dione and Rhea came, more data has come from the Cassini mission. Ganymede, we're very excited by the JUICE mission on that. But it's not only formed by, um, it's not a biosignature. It's made by those icy layers being bombarded by magnetospheric ions, in the case of both Saturn and Jupiter, making the ozone. So I'm afraid ozone is no good. It will not be a unique biosynthesis marker. It might be one of the easiest ones to look for, for if we can measure UV spectra of any exoplanet atmosphere because it's so characteristic. But it doesn't mean that it's a biomarker. So what else would you look for? Well, we've been looking at the Earth with infrared and other spectroscopies for some time. 
And we can detect in our atmosphere these compounds, uh, a whole variety of compounds, pinenes, lemonine, eucalyptol. Um, they're all there in the atmosphere. They all come from plants. So you might say, oh, could I look for something that might come from a plant? Um, yes, you could, but probably in our lifetime, it would be the sensitivity for doing that on an extended body is just not going to happen. It's too complicated. Um, could we look for something like this? This is a spectrum taken of the Earth from a satellite looking down. And what you're seeing here, all the green here, is the chlorophyll. And the chlorophyll is telling you about plants. You'll also see down in Antarctica, you'll see the black, which is actually the most intense. That's chlorophyll from the photoplankton. So if you could end up being able to take a, a, a spectra of, the, of a planet surface like this, then maybe you could be looking for things like this. Again, way outside at the moment <clears throat> of our technologies at the moment. If you could look at reflectance spectra of a planet, uh, then you can measure um, at what we do now. It's how we look at uh, sensing in the Earth today. We look at uh, vegetation, and vegetation has very characteristic uh, reflection bands. So we can measure those and do measure those. And you'd have probably heard about something called the red edge, which is basically that plants have chlorophyll um, in them, and there's this characteristic red edge which you'll see when you have anything operating by photosynthesis. So maybe you could be looking for this red edge on a planetary uh, remote planet surface. Maybe that's the spectroscopy you should be doing. You'll also see there what we call the chlorophyll bump, which is again very characteristic. We, we, we look for those now on Earth. We, we measure something called the Earthshine spectrum, uh, which is the reflected spectrum um, from the moon looking at the light coming off the moon, reflected from the Earth off the moon, and you'll see there the red edge. So some people feel that we could, we could use that. Now, the first visible light spectrum from an exoplanet was observed only, only four years ago, or five years ago, and this is the first ever detection of reflected light from an exoplanet. So, so it was taken uh, in Chile on the uh, European Southern Observatory Observatory by the team uh, in Porto in, in Portugal. So it shows that that... that even though at the moment it may seem a little bit futuristic, the techniques are beginning to develop. And maybe in 10 or 20 years, we'll have the sensitivity. We might be able to look at some of these spectra. So the future really is to continue to look for biosignatures, to look for in exoplanetary atmospheres and the search for signatures of life. These may be gas phase. They may be ozone. They may be some combination of hydrocarbons that they're interested in. Um, or they may be reflecting um, on the surfaces of the, of the planet and so on, etc. They will all be driven by technology. They will all be driven by the, the way in which we build detectors and the way that we build um, space-based observatories, which are much bigger and have better higher resolution. But if you consider how far we've come in 20 or 30 years, if you would think, predict ahead where we might be in the next 50 years, I'm still relatively confident that, that, that by combining our uh, technology and, and, and modeling and studies, we might be able to actually identify some biosignatures. The last five minutes of the talk, I say, let's come back to Earth. Uh, we are looking for, what about looking biomarkers in and on? Now, we can't do that, of course, on an exoplanet, but we can do it on our own, on our own planet. We can go and look and see when life began on Earth by looking at um, fossil records or, or oldest rocks on the Earth. We are going to, to Mars to look at rocks on Mars to see if there is any evidence of life in the rocks. Now, um, we go back now to, to using infrared and Raman spectroscopy to look for microbiology. So if, if you go and actually take a rock and you, you do an image of it um, using infrared or confocal microscopy, for example, of Raman imaging, you will get a spectrum from that rock. You will get a geological spectrum like I showed you earlier on where we know we've got silicates and uh, so on in space. But we've got our rock in our hands. We, we've got some stuff on that. But we may have embedded in it some, some, some biological signatures. And this is, this is what we're planning to do on Mars in the new spectrometer, which is going out there, something called Sherlock. We'll be doing exactly this. It will be using Raman uh, to look for organics and chemicals in those rocks. So... Again, uh, you may well have somebody else giving you one of these webinars who will talk much more about uh, looking for life and so on in rocks. 
But again, it's a spectroscopic technique. You have to then work with geologists to do it. But we're not going to be too far away from doing that. And as I say, we will be having a live experiment on Mars, hopefully in the next few years, where we'll be able to shine light onto the rocks, get the reflected spectrum back, and just look for these type of spectra here. And looking at these spectra, we'll be able to say, okay, here is a rock that maybe at some time set some organic growth on it. It might have been an algae film growing in the bottom of a Martian lake. Uh, that chemical signature will remain and we'll be able to look for it. And how exciting will that be if we actually get back to identify that? Again, very complicated. Uh, we have to also go and uh, do some field studies on Earth. We have to go to similar places on Earth. It's one of the things that Europe then it does to get samples so that we can test out these techniques on Earth before we try and do them in space and build the instruments in space. But it's coming. It will be coming, and it will be coming soon. So uh, I'm coming up to the uh, the end, the 50-minute mark, take time for some questions. Um, what I've tried to do in this talk is really just explain to you in broad terms how the use of spectroscopy can be used in astrobiology. So if you're going to want to get into astrobiology, and if you want to become an astrobiologist, um, then you will also have to be a spectroscopist. Uh, and you'll have to refresh your knowledge of spectroscopy. You will have to, to do some, some basic spectroscopy. You will have to go and learn the techniques, infrared spectroscopy, Raman spectroscopy, maybe UV spectroscopy. In future, increasingly terahertz spectroscopy. These are the tools that you will have for your trade. We've seen how we can use spectroscopy to study exoplanets. We have the spectra coming back of exoplanetary atmospheres. We have to understand the the spectroscopy uh, well. We have to therefore make measurements at the right temperature conditions, right pressure conditions to, to produce laboratory data, uh, which we can use to, to explain the spectra. But no matter how many experiments we do, that's never going to be enough. So increasingly, you'll, we have to calculate those spectra. We have to be able to have really, really good uh, physical, chemical, spectroscopic models of really quite complicated molecules. Uh, and we have to make sure that those are reliable. We've also seen how we can use biosignatures using spectroscopy. And this is perhaps the, the biggest link to astrobiology. Those biosignatures, whether they are for extinct life or whether they are there for existing life, that's, that's central to the core of the field of astrobiology. What signatures are we looking for to say that there has been life on a planet like Mars or there is life uh, on an exoplanet? And I said we've used some examples at the end that we can use for search for the ancient life on Mars. So say the, the rocks look very classical there and in Mars. So I think I've used up my time. So I think what I should do is um, stop there. And I think I should stop sharing so I can see you if you have questions. Yes. Thank you. And Barlow is now back on. And if Barlow is showing, so Barlow, if you lean forward, you will see Barla's astrochemistry system, as I showed you, as a picture behind him. There it is. Right. Should go on the lab. Just, just in the lab. So, if you want to go and see one in action when you're allowed to move around India, go to Ahmedabad. Questions? Yes. Thank you, Professor Nigel. <coughs> uh, so, Joshipura, do you have any questions? There are questions coming up from students. I can Is there anything in the chat? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Am I audible? I can hear you. Okay, yeah. So there are uh, many questions coming through. I'll read one, uh, uh, one by one. We are getting the questions in the YouTube chat. And at the same time, I'm, we are getting questions uh, the other link. This is okay, a, a question from, from yeah. This is a question from uh, Arunaditya Das. Can we use phosphate as biosignature because they are present in the RNA and DNA? Absolutely, good question. Um, if you are an astronomer uh, and if you've been around for a while, you will know that that astronomers like to have different. Um, Hunts for different molecules. So there's the hunt for oxygen, hunt for sulfur, hunt for nitrogen. <clears throat> phosphorus and phosphorus is a very interesting one. Um, we haven't seen much of it. It, it. 
it, the, 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 again, going back to the fundamentals, life as we know it, the DNA, you're absolutely right, needs phosphorus in it. It's, we always ask undergraduate students, what are the molecules of life? And they get carbon and they get oxygen and they get nitrogen and they get uh, so on. But they tend to forget phosphor and sulfur. So um, there, is a, there is a space mission called Cheops, 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 which is exactly that. Let's go and look for carbon, hydrogen, uh, oxygen, phosphor and sulfur. Um, now, I think phosphorus is a very interesting one um, because uh, its role in, in chemistry and its role in biology um, is still subject to, to well, I'd say debate, but it's, still, it's still a subject of research. And I think you're absolutely right. I think phosphorus is one of those compounds we should look for. Um, but actually, we don't have many, we haven't found many molecules of it in space, um, and we don't really know too much about its synthesis. So it's a very good question. Uh, whether that would then give us a unique biomarker, I don't have an answer to that. Maybe. But yes, concentrating on phosphorus, I think, is going to be uh, one of, it, it, will, it will feature in the next space mission, certainly, in trying to think up an inventory and what sort of molecules you have. Um, it's not an easy compound to work with, actually. Most of the phosphorus compounds are not the easiest ones to actually work with in the laboratory either. Um, so actually making spectra and measurements of some of them, that's why they haven't been done. It's not a nice compound. Sulfur's not a nice compound. Many of the sulfur compounds are nice, but uh, phosphorus work. Next. Thank you. So next question is from uh, Rover. When we use FDIR or Raman spectroscopy, what kind of biomarkers are we actually expecting to see? And how do we conclude that? Well, if you if you are looking for um, say origins of life, if you're looking for rocks, then essentially what you're looking for are some of those molecules that are related to the biological um, cellular structure. So you should be able to look at some of the uh, compounds that will make up the membranes or the those sort of things. Now the the easy way of doing this is uh, if you want to do an experiment, uh, you want to do an undergraduate experiment, uh, is go out. Pick up a rock that's been covered in algae, um, which you'll find plenty of in any pond, um, and stick it in front of your spectrometer, if you can do a reflection spectrum of it, and look and see what you see. You will see the chlorophyll spectrum. The chlorophyll spectrum, of course, is an absolute classic. Um, but you will find many other things as well, which are related to the structure, of the uh, cellular structures, basically. So they're the sort of things that you you you, you can Okay. And the next question is from uh, Patank. Can pyrolysis mass spectroscopy be used to evaluate the samples from sample determinations? Right. Okay. I, as I said, there wasn't time to talk about the other type of spectroscopy. We, we talked about uh, optical spectroscopy, mass spectrometry, mass, uh, whether you call it mass spectrometry or mass spectroscopy, another debate we can have. Um, but uh, using a mass spectrometry or mass spectroscopy, to see molecules, absolutely. Of course, most of the stuff in the uh, in the comet work uh, was done that way. Most of the work in the comets was done by, by by taking your samples and heating them up, and then seeing what it is. Um, it's taking an ice and warming it up and seeing what comes off. Now we do those experiments, and indeed um, the experiments that that we've been developing most most recently is to combine in situ UV or infrared spectroscopy with mass spectrometry. But if you are radiating an ice for an astrochemistry experiment or a planetary experiment, and you're changing the composition of the ice, um, you can then warm up the ice and you can see what molecules come off. And that's where you can use the mass spectroscopy, mass spectrometry to see what you make. You can also get sputtering. So, for example, one of the things in the JUICE mission will be to see what comes off from the magnetospheric ions as they hit these icy moons, they'll throw molecules off these icy moons and we'll detect them with mass spectrometers. The only problem is that, that in doing that, you can actually change the chemicals of what you make. So when we warm up something in the ice, uh, if we didn't actually have in situ spectroscopy, if we weren't measuring the infrared spectra at the same time and we only looked at the stuff after it being heated up, we wouldn't know whether that molecule was made in the heating up process or whether it was made in the irradiation process. So you need to combine both together. So mass spectrometry is is, is a great technique. It's, it's the one, of course, we've predominantly used in things like, uh, uh, as I say, the, uh, the telomy uh, mass spectrometry on the Rosetta to, to look at some of those molecules uh, which were found on the comets. Um, 
But you also have to be, again, it's an interpretation issue. You've got to be a little bit careful to assume that the molecule you're seeing there is not being made in your heating process or your extraction processes. Um, so, you, yeah, but you're absolutely right. Um, you would, the classic way would be to combine infrared spectroscopy and mass spectrometry. You can't use mass spectrometry easily if you're doing a flyby at a few thousand or hundred thousand kilometers away from the icy body, then you've only got UV spectroscopy. But if you can land on it, then of course you can use mass spectrometry. And there are lots of different types of mass spectrometry. Thank you. And the next question is uh, by Suryan Saha. Is the search for biosignature by spectroscopy an effective tool? Can, can spectroscopy only be sufficient enough for detecting light? Well, um, in our lifetime, it's the only one we're going to have for looking at exoplanets. Uh, maybe one day we'll get into Star Trek and uh, etc. and go there, but I don't think it's going to happen in our lifetimes. Um, so we, it's the only tool we've got for looking for exoplanets. Um, if you ideally there was nothing better than going and if you wanted to look at Mars or you want to look at Titan, uh, the two classic systems that we'd like to go and look at, or even the icy moons of Jupiter, uh, sending things to land on them is obviously an, a, another a better advantage. You know, having rovers to move around and so on is better than trying to do remote spectroscopy. Even better than that is to rather than have a rover to have a have a human being who can who can make decisions and, and do slightly different things. Um, so the answer is, uh, as far as, as, as exoplanets are concerned, it's the only tool we're going to have. So it's the only one, we're, only way, spectroscopy is the only way we're going to be able to do it. For Mars, um, yes, uh, you've seen already there, the Raman and the infrared for looking at rocks will be a powerful tool. But actually getting those rocks and bringing them back so that we can use a lot of other analytical chemistry tools, GCMS and so on, which are much more limited of whether we could do those on a rover or in situ. But if we could go and collect some samples and bring them back and then examine those rocks in the same way as we can go to places in Australia or South Africa or so on and collect rock samples to look for the evidence of early life on Earth, that would be even better. And that's why sample mission in return is very important. Thank you. So there's another question by Patnaik. Now it's being discussed to bring samples back from Mars. And again, within the student's lifetime, we'll do it. Go ahead. Go ahead, Bala. Sorry, I could not hear. I thought uh, you uh, finished. Sorry for interrupting. Carry on. There's another question uh, by Patnaik. Will spectroscopy be used to differentiate between different forms of ice? Different forms of? Uh, different forms of ice. Absolutely. Uh, if you mean different forms of ice, if you mean, well, it depends what you mean by different forms of ice. Do you mean different layers? The structure of the ice will very much can be determined by the spectroscopy. Um, the subtlety is that when you mix molecules together in the ice, there are small chemical shifts, there are small spectroscopic shifts. So depending, by analyzing that, and also by using terahertz radiation to see how the molecules may actually be be uh, interacting through, say, small van der Waals uh, interaction. You can actually say a lot of information about the structure of the ice and, 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 and how it's formed. So the obvious one is, is, is you will see a different spectrum from a crystalline ice and an amorphous ice. So you can very easily just by, by saying, OK, that water is crystalline, that water is amorphous. That will tell you something about how that ice has been formed or how it has been processed. But this goes for all other molecules as well. So the form, if you like, of the ice, if you mean by form the structure of the ice, yes. It will also tell you whether your ice is fully mixed or whether it is layered. All these things can be seen by probing the spectroscopy. That's why it's a powerful tool. Next. Okay, thank you. So the next question is from Arkan Das, terahertz uh, spectra. Terahertz spectra for gas phase molecules now based on observations like SOFIA and actual etc. Please comment on the atmospheric transmission for the, for the ground-based observation of gas in the terahertz. Yes, uh, you're correct that, that, that 
that both uh, Sophia, the aircraft, have made their terahertz measurements. Um, there are windows, just in the same way there are terahertz windows. There are spectral windows in the atmosphere for terahertz, just as there are for UV, just as there are for infrared. Um, but obviously, the best thing is to have a terahertz system in space. Then you don't have to worry about the atmosphere at all. Uh, but if you're looking at things like ALMA, ALMA's working in those regions and et cetera, um, the, the, the slight problem is that, that we don't know enough about some of those terahertz. Uh, we don't have, for example, I know people who are now doing it who are looking at terahertz spectra of aerosols. So there's a lot of aerosols in the atmosphere. There's a lot of uh, biological aerosols in the atmosphere. They, they have a terahertz signal. Um, now, um, we don't know enough about them to know whether some of those effects are going to be so ground-based terahertz uh, spectra uh, may well be affected by that. But if you build your, your telescopes in an area where the atmosphere is clean and you're away from things, like ALMA is, then those, those effects are reduced. Um, ultimately, the best thing is, is to have something like JWST where you don't have to worry about the Earth's atmosphere at all. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question is, if we go to the icy moon to, uh, in search of life, what would be the signature that you would look for? Very good question. Um, so, uh, the JUICE mission, uh, the mission to the uh, icy moons of Jupiter, what will we look for? Um, well, um, the belief is that if, if there is life on those moons, it will be subsurface life. So it will be in the ocean beneath the ice cap. Um, so we're not going to be able to probe that easily. However, um, if there are eruptions, uh, there are little ejections coming out of their plumes uh, coming out from the surface, some of those nutrients and some of those molecules will be carried up to the surface and spray out. Now, we can detect those either by uh, optical, by, by one of the spectroscopic methods we talked about today, or you may be able to capture some of those particles, bring them onto your, your craft and do a mass spectrometry analysis. So it then comes down to exactly the same as anything else. What, what sort of fire signal do you look for for life? Um, if it's organic life, you will be looking for some of those organic signatures. What we don't know or what we have to try and work out is how will those be changed in their process of coming up from the ocean? It's unlikely. I mean, you know, I don't think we're going to be looking for, uh, for you know, an amoeba or something that was un a Ganymede or a, a Europa me amoeba that somehow has managed to carry itself up through the ice surface into your space car. It's going to be broken down. So again, you just have to do those experiments. You have to take the sort of life that you want to do, put it under those conditions, see what you make, um, see what your spectral signature, either by mass spectrometry or infrared or whatever, will be, and then say, if I get that spectra in my spacecraft, then maybe that's what it came from. So it's always a detective work. You, you, you know, as I say, we we can't we, we know there's life. You know, we we it's like on the Earth, the the, the Antarctic lakes, Lake Vostok, and so on. Um, you know, how do you detect what life is down there? You can drill down, of course. It's very dangerous because you could pollute it. But, you know, you can drill down and ultimately take a sample and then you can put it under a microscope and have a look. We won't have that option on, on, on Galilean moons. We'll have to look at what other stuff comes up. And probably it's going to be destroyed. So it's going to be some form of life that's been broken down. What fragments would survive a journey like that? Well, the only way to do that is to do the experiments and see what, what life on Earth breaks down to. And then look for those things in your spacecraft. Thank you. There is one more question uh, from Rohit Satish. The question is, what if there is different DNA and RNA in the exoplanets than what we see on Earth? So I'm just adding one more. So I didn't what hear you there, Bala. You broke up. Okay. So there is a question. Bala, from you Bala. broke up. Can you... Can you hear me now? Am I yes. audible? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So there is a question from uh, Rohit Satish. What if there is different DNA and RNA in the exoplanets ah. we see on Earth? So I'm just adding what if there is a different chlorophyll. Yeah, that's an... Absolutely. It's, uh, that's, a, that's an extremely good question. What happens if life evolved in a different way? 
very, <coughs> very is something which it doesn't have a model for. So, so you know, could, could we come up with another form of life? Could we, could we understand it? Could we make another type of synthetic life? It's very difficult to know um, to that question. What you can ask is whether the, the molecules and the DNA song would adapt to a slightly different conditions. Um, so, for example, if I take photosynthesis, the classic example, um, the plants on Earth have somehow evolved that they like they like sunlight they, and they know what the spectrum of our sun is and they know that the absorption is, is it's yellow basically so sunlight is yellow so the, the photosynthesis system the molecules are kind of worked out that, that that the most effective way is to take where most of the light is coming through so it's it's yellow light and then therefore the the spectrum and the photosynthetic and the molecules work on that now if we had another planet where the sky wasn't yellow and uh, the sun wasn't yellow, but the sun looked red or the sun looked blue. Um, would there be a photosynthetic process that, that operated to be more efficient to work in the blue and the uh, red? And the answer probably to that is yes, it would. It would adapt. It would do it. Um, the question we then have to ask is, is what would that lead to in the, um, in the change of the uh, biological molecules and how they would work? Is there another type of DNA? Um, is there a life that's based on sulfur? Is there a life that's based uh, on, um, what was the one that came out a few years ago? Arsenic. People suggested, oh, you know, we maybe found a life form that instead of having, I think it was swapping phosphorus for arsenic, if I remember or something, I'm reaching back a bit. Um, it, it turned out that it, that, 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 that was a bit of a false uh, result. But yeah, absolutely very good questions, which we really don't have answers. Um, the only way you could probably do that is by is by going in, is, is playing with with uh, synthetic biology and, and having a look. Um, so yeah, it's a very good question. Um, and what the routes from RNA and PNA are to DNA, is it inevitable it went down that route? Um, or could, another, could it have gone off on another branch and therefore we got a slightly different? This comes back to the question of cause and effect. Um, did life evolve on Earth because it adapted to how the Earth is? Uh, um, or is it inevitable that once you start a life chain, you go down the same route? That's why trying to find another, another evidence of life having evolved somewhere else, like on Mars, would be so interesting, because then we could answer some of those questions. But yeah, you need a bit, a bit of philosophy and... Uh, as well as uh, science to, to think about those questions. But very good question. So thank you. I think we are running time. Maybe uh, I'll again get back to Sajoshipura. Your mic is on. Uh -huh. Okay, very nice. Thank you, Professor Nigel, for an excellent talk. As usual, you have always been very nice as an excellent speaker. The main theme was uh, very nice. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Hello? Yeah, we can hear you. Yes. Right. So, um, the essential idea was spectroscopy in search of uh, life, in search of exobiology, astrobiology. And you started uh, very well by considering various regions of the electromagnetic spectrum, how different people look at various regions and what is it uh, that defined it, especially how different uh, molecules respond to various regions of uh, the electromagnetic spectrum. And you asked a very valid question, Professor Nigel. I mean, uh, coming back to Earth, how if, if we were to search for life on Earth from outside, <laughs> what would we look for as biomarkers? As by what will the what would be the signatures of life on the earth, and that would be a lesson. That would be a lesson for us to search for life in the exoplanets. So that was very nice. Thank you so much. Also, we thank all those who have taken interest. Uh, Professor ba Dr. Bala is doing very nice work at PRL. We'll come to know more about it. Uh -huh. And so uh, it seems it's again indeed a pleasure. To thank the speaker, Professor Nigel Mason. Very nice. Very nice. Thank you. Very much. Nice. I'll just thank conclude you. by uh, oh yeah, I'll sorry. just finish by saying thank you. Uh, for, and uh, say um, I'm sure Bala can 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 share the slides. We can put them into a PDF, and maybe you can post them somewhere. I don't think there's a problem with that. 
Um, if people do have other questions, they want to follow up afterwards. Um, Bala's got my email. Be happy to do that. Um, there are societies, astrobiology societies around. Um, so if people are not a member, um, Bala may want to say something about the Indian Astrobiology Society. Uh, this uh, last week, we had the, the second meeting of the European Astrobiology Institute, uh, which you can also look up, EAI. It has a whole series of working groups. Anybody can join. Okay, it's based in Europe, but anybody around uh, the world can participate in that. It's an institutional-based institution. It's not a personal membership institution like Europlanet is. You can join Europlanet. You can join Europlanet as an individual member. Uh, there are lots of these sort of meetings and conferences, and there are also opportunities for using facilities. The Europlanet facilities, again, Barla might want to post something to people in this uh, on the links for that. Um, where we actually offer uh, instruments and so on for doing these type of experiments for anybody, including uh, students and, and researchers in India. So plenty of opportunities for collaboration. And as I say, this is a very exciting field. So I hope many of you will have the opportunity to, to work with us. And I hope this talk has given you some things to think about if you're a student, about the career that you might follow over the next 30 or 40 years. Thank you. I'd like to add just one point. There are a lot of students uh, watching this uh, in YouTube live. So I hope uh, from this lecture they have, uh, they may have an idea now that uh, even though you do physics, you can do astrophysics. Okay, so thank you, Professor Nigel. Uh, Bobby, would like to say something? Uh, no, no, I'm fine. Thank you, Nigel. Hi. Hi, everyone. Yeah, it was a nice talk and thanks. Thanks, Bala. Thanks, Nigel. Yeah, may see you on Friday. Thank you all. Okay, thank you. Bye bye. Uh, okay. Questions? We'll, we'll write uh, an email. Uh, hello. We'll get it to you in email. Okay. Uh, the live is now. Upload group.